two, one. We can yeah. start. So very good evening again all for this uh, another episode of this Young Surgeon Forum. This has been an activity run by Dr. Vasudev Gadigone, who has been pioneer in uh, 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 in uh, conceptualizing this concept of giving the opportunity of young budding orthopedic surgeons this uh, platform to showcase their presentations. So for today's episodes, we are very uh, fortunate to have Kolhapur Orthopedic Association as the host uh, team. And we will be having Dr. Rajendra Bhankar, who will be the convener for uh, today's uh, uh, Young Surgeon Forum episode. Uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar Santapure and Dr. Prashant Tonpe, uh, the panelists for today's uh, symposium. Dr. Deepak Sahastrabudde will be uh, moderator for this today's uh, session. And there are five speakers uh, who will be presenting their cases. And we will be having a certainly good, complex, and unusual presentations of various uh, different case scenarios in orthopedics. So before proceeding, I would like Dr. Vasudev Gadikone to have a brief welcome of all the delegates. And then we will ask Dr. Abhankar to give a brief introduction of the speakers uh, which will be presenting today. Good evening <clears throat> to the viewers of Ortho TV and all delegates of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association members and Kolhapur Orthopedic Society. I welcome you all for this a very prestigious webinar from the Kolhapur Orthopedic Society. And I welcome all young surgeons they are looking here. So I, I am uh, looking for them to have a very wonderful webinar in future also. And now I hand over the mic to our convener, uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association President-elect, Dr. Rajendra Abhankar to carry out further proceedings and to introduce the young surgeons of Kolhapur Orthopedic uh, Association. So welcome Dr. Rajendra Abhankar sir and all faculties of this webinar. And I also thanks my colleagues of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, uh, Dr. Tonpe, Dr. Santapureji and Dr. Sahastra Buddha, <coughs> our colleague from Kolhapur, very active member of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association who is going to moderate this session. So over to Dr. Rajendra Abhinda. <clears throat> yeah, good evening. Namaste. I welcome all of you for this seminar. This is only due to the Dr. Gade Gone's initiative that we are able to present our work and this is very rare opportunity for young orthopedic surgeons from Kolhapur. Dr. Shiv Kumar Santapure, Dr. Prashant Tonpe and Dr. Pahukar from Maharashtra Orthopedic Association are helping us in presentations. There are five young orthopedic surgeons who have established themselves very well in Kolhapur. Dr. Pradeep Patil is the senior most of them. He is a trauma surgeon and he's presenting his work at various fora. His specialty, apart from orthopedics, he's an iron man who always keeps running and swimming and cycling. The next will be Dr. Rajiv Negandi, who is known as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in this area. And he was a organizing secretary of the recent POSICON held in Kolhapur. Dr. Sachin Gunke is an arthroscopy and orthoplasty surgeon who also has established himself very well in Kolhapur and has a few cases to present. Dr. Amit Purande works especially in diabetic food. He has done uh, a research work in that area, has visited a US hospital also, and has learned and is teaching a lot about diabetic food in and around Kolhapur. The youngest of the lot is Dr. Abhijit Khade, who has come up very nicely in a short span of few years in Kolhapur's horizon, and he will be presenting his case over here. With this brief introduction, I welcome them all and hand it over to Dr. Manoj Pohukar, who will be moderating this. Uh, Dr. Sahasrabuddha may not be able to join due to some issues with his net. So I request Dr. Manoj or Dr. Pradeep Patil to moderate the session. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Abhankar, sir. Uh, Pradeep, sir, I have Pradeep. Yeah. Pradeep. Sir. Yes, you can moderate, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. 
So I think he is the first speaker. So may I, I now invite uh, Dr. Pratip Patel to start sharing his screen, and uh, he will be uh, giving this case presentation of a bone transport in open fractures. And I would request our uh, Dr. Santapure and Dr. Tonpe sir to uh, make it more interactive and could ask questions in between if there are any queries or at the end as they like. Dr. Pradeep Patil, please start yes, sharing. Sir. So good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible and visible? Sir, full yeah. screen, full screen, Kara. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, I'm presenting two cases of a open tibial fracture paired with bone transport. This is the first case. This is the 30 year male uh, with red road traffic accident. And he was having open grade three C tibia fracture where his distal circulation was absent, but he was not having any other injuries and he was hemodynamically stable. So this was his clinical picture. This was a amount of contamination and a mode of injury. You can see the active pulsation from the anterior tibial artery. And there is an extensive soft tissue injury as well as an extensive periosteal reaction. And the comminuted bone fragment of the tibia was not having any periosteal attachment. So the patient uh, was immediately uh, taken to the operation theater. His vascular repair was done by a plastic surgeon and his bone fragments were removed of the fibula as well as tibia and we have made acute shortening and try to close the wound as possible as like this. And this was the picture. Uh, first picture is uh, in post-surgery and second picture after one week. Uh, this is the x-ray picture where uh, you can see there is a docking and uh, the, it has been fixed with the external fixer temporarily. The wound was uh, then grafted by the plastic surgeon. Uh, at this time, he was having around 5 cm of true shortening. Uh, there was a, a loss of active uh, dorsiflexion. The sensations were present both dorsal as well as plantar aspect of the foot. So we decided to continue the treatment. So uh, his external fixator was then converted into Elizaro ring, ring fixator and gradual distraction was started. So these are the X-ray pictures of the gradual distraction. You can see there is a good, uh, there is a very minimal regenerate at the corticotomy site. And also there is no evidence of a callus at the fracture site also after one and a half month. Then we keep on distracting the fracture. And after five months, we can, uh, we can able to see the uh, regenerate at the corticotomy site, but there was a no signs of a union at the fracture site. So at this peak, at seven months, the consolidation was good, but still there was a uh, uh, no activity across the fracture site. So we decided to go inside and put a graft. So I have kept, uh, this was a eight month post surgery and we opened the fracture and put the intramedullary as well as the extra cortical graft. And this was a final picture where you can see the graft in, into the medullary canal and the fracture is healed very well. These are the uh, X-ray after removal of the external fixator. He is still having around one, cent, uh, uh, one inch of a true shortening, but he is, he is, this is the video where he can walk. <laughs> So this is the video how he walks. <clears throat> okay, then I'm pre I'm presenting my second case. Okay, 
Yes, am I audible and visible? Yeah, I think but uh, this yes, is yes, good. very much. Okay. Uh, so this is my second case. This is thirty year female. Yeah, I think we uh, we are not able to see your screen. You need to uh, start it again. Okay, right. So this is another case. A thirty-year female with road traffic accident, with run over injury, and he does not have any other injury. But surprisingly, he was uh, uh, having good neurovascular condition. The distal circulation was good, and this is his clinical picture, where you can see there is a no periosteum, uh, and there is a lot complete devoid of the soft tissue. So we decided to. Uh, temporarily fix the fracture after removal of the bony fragments so this was a picture where all the bony fragments were removed and was kept in a external fixator and we tried to close the wound but this was a mistake i have done so it, that was closed in under tension and that usually leads to uh, necrosis of the surrounding skin as well as a, a soft, uh, uh, other problems so then we continue on uh, dressing the wound and this was the final picture where uh, this was the final uh, necrosis so we decided to cover the fracture with the help of a soft tissue so before that uh, uh, make a antibiotic uh, cement spacer we are kept inside and with the help of plastic surgeon we covered the wound this was a x ray picture after the at the time of surgery where the intramedullary bone cement spacer was kept and uh, we have done a rotational flap for the tibia and with the uh, and the partial thickness screening graft also on the posterior side uh, uh, but uh, in the follow up uh, everything healed well but the distal portion of the wound of the flap was open so uh, and the bone spacer was uh, looking outside so it was open again it was open so at that time it was very difficult to reflap the wound so we decided to uh, uh, again uh, 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 do the shortening so this was the procedure done we have done a acute shortening at the level of fibula and we shorten the wound so that the uh, the gap of the skin can be closed primarily so this was again done and then subsequently after wound healing uh, i have removed the spacer and it was replaced by fibular graft and this was intramedullary fibular graft which was kept from the same wound so we are not used from the other side with the same graft tibia was uh, uh, same tibial graft was placed intramedullary and we gradually started distracting the fracture so this was a uh, x ray at the time of distraction but she badly stuck in the covid crisis so at that time the uh, follow up was very difficult but some of some of the distraction was going on well so this was the distraction so around 4 uh, cm of bone transport was done and you can see the good consolidate of consolidation of the intramedullary tibial uh, uh, fibular graft with with upper and lower end of the tibia this was again follow up x ray this is again neck follow up x ray where you can see the corticotomy has been healed well as well as the fibular graft also healed well and you can see regeneration of the new fibula and this is the final picture where Uh, there is again a new fibula formation as well as intramedullary graft is very good and this was his uh, today's picture uh, she was walking without any problem so to conclude uh, to conclude uh, op uh, elizarao is a still very good of modality of treatment in certain very difficult cases where you can manage all the problems like infection shortening uh, deformity in a single single time thank you very much i think that's a excellent uh, case presentation with good to follow up uh, very good results considering the complexity of the case so anybody having any questions for me in the first case it was a vascular injury
in what time did he attend it uh, to you within less than 6 hours yeah actually this patient was our uh, hospital manager so he was immediately shifted to the hospital within 2 hours and immediately within 6 hours we repaired the uh, injury so we have not done we are not waited for angiography we immediately taken him to the operation theater so one question is that it, whether it was grafted or it was just repaired end to end repair it was end to end repair because there was the acute shortening i i have removed around 5 cm of the tibia and fibula so okay. there was a uh, shortening so there was no need of a graft for that okay, okay. so it's again by indiza or its station I think uh, uh, there there are wonderful cases, but I have seen that uh, is there any role of back in such a situation which reduces the span of uh, wound management? Because probably you have not used the back and it's such a open wound and a large wound. When there is a problem of granulation tissue and where you do a so many other things without a soft tissue coverage, so we need to have a, some. Uh, uh this vac uh, which reduces the uh, span of your wound healing and also it helps into the further plastic surgical work uh, sir i have in first case i have not used vac this is because it is a vascular injury the patient is on heparin so in heparin as patient is uh, not advisable to use vac because in long term the anti plate anti coagulants are going on and in the second case uh the wound was closed and the timing between uh, uh means graft means we immediately converted the necrotics where the skin was necrotic we immediately converted that wound into a flap so i usually use vac uh, in a long term cases but in two cases these were the specific problem so that's why i not use vac yeah oh. in the vascular injury patient i think the elisaro sometimes could be problematic because there is only single artery which is uh, giving all the circulation and sometimes this pins could cause a problem so sometimes i would like to prefer the lrs uh, assembly in such kind of uh, situations where we are more predictable in putting the pins so any experience uh, with this so uh, nay i also use lrs but the lrs problem is this treatment will require very long time more than 2 years actually so okay. at this time the problems of the lrs are uh, problem if the pin tract get infected in a in between sometimes because the patients are from rural area and the carrying of the pin tract is very tough and if any pin get infected near the corticotomy site or distal site the replacing plane in a uh, uh, lrs is very tough actually so that's why i not use lrs uh, pradeep okay. sir in the second case whether you you used a vascularized fibular graft no sir no sir in second case i not use vascularized fibular graft i use the fibula from the same side okay but because of the age you use same yeah, yeah because of age yeah if the patient was around 14 year age uh, girl that's why uh, suppose if that patient was adult then you might have to use from other side because it is no i am i might have the not have used of the factor side again no i am not may not have used fibula i have used a simple bone transport um, that might be bifocal if more required more more regenerate or more lengthening okay sir so you always prefer acute docking or sometimes to go for a slight uh, the bone transport completely in a phase uh, wise manner so that that depends on the how much is bone loss if the bone loss is more than 5 cm so i don't prefer for acute docking but if the bone loss is um, less than that i prefer to a acute docking but the problem of acute docking is uh, you have to uh, uh, the advantage of acute docking is at the it, it is very easy to convert Uh, external fixator in acute docking to elisaro because there is no problem of alignment but if you are not done acute docking and converting elisaro uh, with a bone uh, defect it sometimes become very difficult when you are going to compress ac across the fracture so there will be some translation and again you have to do uh, multiple jugglers for that so i most of the time i try to dock acutely okay And the one last question is like uh, the foot drop or the foot contractures are very common either with that first vascular injury case or here elisaro for such a long time. So how do you prevent those equinus problems uh, in these patients? Eh? No, no. Basically, uh, basically I use always include an ankle frame. I uh, mean, so foot frame. Uh, always use foot frame where, whenever there is a lengthening going on. And my if my lengthening is over and if the consolidation is good. 
at the front, distal as well as proximal, uh, distal side especially. Then I try to remove the distal ring and ask the patient to wet bear. Second thing, I always use a dorsiflexion, means a specially made slippers, where I always keep it in a dorsiflex position. So this is the most important thing that at the, during this uh, treatment, you have to uh, always keep the limb in a dorsiflexion. Uh, I miss a power, uh, miss a, a dorsiflexion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if there are no further questions, I thank you, Dr. Pradeep Patizar, for such a wonderful two cases. And now we move ahead for the second case for today's episode. I invite Dr. Sachin Gunke to start uh, sharing his screen. And uh, he will be presenting this very interesting case of an MPFL reconstruction in uh, recurrent patellar dislocation. Thank you, sir. I am sharing my screen. Uh, am I visible? Shall I start my presentation? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Good evening to all. Today I am going to present my short uh, study that is a retrospective study of MPFL reconstruction for recurrent dislocation of patella. As you all know, is patella femoral instability is uh, one of the disabling knee problem. <clears throat> this etiology is multifactorial. Soft tissue and bone are the main stabilizer for patella tracking. Out of that, medial patellar femoral ligament is the oh, primary. Oh, oh, for preventing the patellar subluxation. There are numerous techniques are employed for the treatment. MPFL reconstruction alone or in, com in bony procedure is well known. There are many techniques for MPFL rec reconstruction, but yet there is no gold standard set for the technique or choice of graft or any fixation option. So we are presenting an implant-free double bundle technique for MPFL reconstruction with the gracilis autograph and partial tunnel in patella. The study is conducted for, for four years from the April 2016 to the March 2020. Total 12 cases were studied. Diagnosis was confirmed by clinical examinations and the X-ray and MRI done to assess any soft tissue and the bony factor which uh, were present in the instability. So operative technique, all patients were operated under spinal anesthesia and pneumatic tourniquet. <laughs> Image intensifier was used. All patients operated in the supine position. Knee orthoscopy was done to deal with any intra-articular pathology if they uh, is there, that pre-orthoscopy was done. So graft harvestation, the gra choice of graft for me was it was a gracilis. Gracilis tendon was identified and harvested through vertical incision. Usually mean length which we obtain is 22 to 24 centimeter and diameter was less than uh, 4 mm. Graft was prepared and the free ends were sutured with the non-absolute sutures. So this was a two to three centimeter incision over the pace and series, and through which the, after incising the sartorius fascia, the gracilis tendon was identified and uh, harvested uh, with the help of tendon stripper. So usually we get the around 20 to 24 centimeter. When we prepare, we'll get, uh, try to make around the 20 centimeter length, which can be utilized for the, as a graft. So second uh, important step is the patellar tunnel preparation. So knee was flexed into 90 degree position. Incision was taken three centimeter on the anterior middle aspect of the patella. Deep dissection was done directly up to the middle border of the patella. Uh, try to uh, care was taken that capsule was not penetrated. Uh, this like this we can go up to directly to the anterior middle uh, uh, middle border of the uh, patella and the capsule we try to keep intact. So these are the instrument which we required for the tunnel preparation. That is two big pin. 4.5 endoscopic reamer, 6.5 or 6 mm uh, uh, reamer. <coughs> then this is the instrument used for the harvesting the graft and uh, for the screw fixation, the screwdriver for the biopsular screw. Sometimes for the uh, for more precise entry or the, for the patella tunnel, we can use the ACL jig uh, or we can use on the uh, freehand technical. So big pin of uh, 2.4 mm diameter is deal transversely at midpoint of the patella at the middle edge of the patella to the lateral border. Care was taken to avoid violation of the anterior cortex and articular cartilage. Two centimeter incision was used on the lateral aspect and the under fluoroscopy so that there is a proper placement of the big pins. Second pin was inserted uh, at the distance of 15 mm parallel to the first pin. Both the pins were all deal with the 4.5 endoscopic reamer for 20 mm depth only. So it is a partially we create the tunnel into the patella. We don't uh, uh, drill throughout the transversely in the patella. 
to passing sutures uh, with the help of the big pin at the same times we pull out pull out the big pin on the other sides and uh, we uh, introduce the uh, passing sutures at the same time in the tunnel so that that will save our time so like this we in pass the two big pins which are transversely uh, and per, uh, in the coronal plane of the patella so at the same time fluoroscopic view at the intro so second uh, most important is the femoral tunnel preparations knees flex to the 30 degree uh, and by palpation and under fluoroscopic to identify the adductor tubercle 3 cm incision was taken and the 2.4 mm big pin deal at the shortal point this is the isometry point which usually very important for the success of the mpl reconstruction so under fluoroscopy again we use to confirm the our uh, our entry point because that is this is very important point for the success so this is the shortal point so uh, what is the shortal point it is determined on the lateral view only first line is extended directly from the posterior aspect of the femur and second line is perpendicular to the first line it is slightly proximal to the posterior most part of the blumen sent line usually this point is the 1 mm anterior superior to the intersection of these two lines so guide pin is over deal with the 6 mm uh, reamer up to depth of 25 to 30 mm and passing sutures are pulled along with the same with along with the guide pin on the lateral aspect so that will also again save times or we can over deal with the 4.5 endoscopic reamer if we want to pass easy passage of the sutures <coughs> graft fixation so graft placement and fixation on the patella side usually first started second and third layer of the medial patello complex is identified because where we expect that mpl should be should lie at the anatomical position capsule we kept intact as we already uh, dissected out free end of the graft was pulled into the patella tunnel with the help of the passing sutures and this graft sutures were tied on the lateral aspect and the knot is buried so in this case we uh, don't use the any uh, any implant on the patella side the basilis tendons loop retroid between the second and third layer on the femoral side and with the help of passing suture graft loop is finally advanced into the femoral tunnel so like this we uh, take a note from the second and third layer on the femoral uh, to the uh, femoral side and with the help of the same passing suture with that we have already introduced in the femoral tunnel we uh, retrieve the graft into the tunnel so knee cycle in 20 to 30 times and finally fix with the help of 7 or whatever uh, 7 or 8 mm usually 7 mm bio absorbable entrepreneur screw at the knee 20 to 30 degree of flexions in moderate tensions so that patella should lie in the just medial to the lateral border of trochlea and uh, it should be uh, slightly lax in the 90 degree of flexion or in extension but in tension in, uh, slightly in the moderate tension in the 20 to 30 degree of uh, flexion so femoral screw fixation was done like the bias screw was used post operative knee brace all patients were uh, kept in the knee brace for 4 weeks after 10 days passive knee bending was started and full range of movements uh, was allowed after 6 weeks weight bearing was started after 4 weeks jogging running after 3 months and sport activity after 9 months and this is post op x ray you can see the patella tunnel on both the sides and the femoral screw fixation this is a subsequent post op x ray which also shows good healing <clears throat> so results all total patients were 12 out of that two were male and uh, 10 were females main duration of surgery was 45 minutes all patient achieved uh, full range of movements within a 3 months except two patients who were in which we take slightly longer times that is 4 and 1/2 months no donor side problem two patient had osteochondral minor osteochondral injury which was still with arthroscopic debridement and two patient had lateral meniscus tear one patient was operated with arthroscopic meniscus repair by all in side technique and another by partial meniscectomy <clears throat> one patient had by mistake uh, patella tunnel was completely drilled transversely hello but, uh, she didn't develop any uh, patella problem so discussion in uh, my conclusion is that my in my study patella fixation technique fir abhi ne crepe bandage aur wo de de unko limb delivery without implant फिर कल ही आ जाओ बोलना एक साथ ही देखे हाथ से बोल चाहिए पर आपको बोलना उनको एंड हैव एडवांटेज ऑफ नो इम्प्लांट रिलेटेड प्रॉब्लम एंड कॉस्टिपेटिव पटेलर टर्निंग एंड रिमिंग इज डन पार्शियली सो दैट अवॉइड द चांस ऑफ पटेलर फ्रैक्चर एंड और एनी सब्सिक्वेंट डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द स्ट्रेस फ्रैक्चर डबल टेक्निक वाज क्रिएटेड ब्रॉड अटैचमेंट साइट फॉर एमपीएमएल इंसर्शन नॉन पेशेंट हैड रिकरेंस ऑफ सिम्टम और एंटीरियर नी पेन 
isometry point uh, isometry point on femoral side is very crucial for the success of this treatment <coughs> need to pay attention towards the physiotherapy to achieve the range of movement since the chance of knee stiffness is comparatively more in these cases <coughs> thank you yeah i think dr sachin you can stop sharing your screen i yes. think uh, yeah wonderful presentation pradeep patel sir you want to take it further yeah Uh, any question uh, from the panelist? Some good case, sir. Yes, sir. Don't be sir. Go ahead. So why you not use the anchors for the? No, and they say uh, one more important anchor. It's a cost. Cost, cost therapy. therapy. Yeah, I, that's why I don't uh, use anchor. But in some cases, previously used to use anchor. but there was some problem regarding crowding of the anchor and then some irritation at the border side and again the most important in our places is the cost so we have, i have shifted to this whether Pasha. you used any uh, specific technique of suturing the medial incision medial patellar incision like uh, that uh, the resting of the vmo on the patella on the capsule no 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 i i, I don't do that things no. you not did no Okay, support you and you tied that uh, no, uh, laterally we tie the all the sutures okay that is the only fixation yeah only fixation on it uh, bond only or i uh, uh, it bond or sometime you know, okay nice technique so uh, now we we'll, uh, uh, if there are in no questions i will uh, request uh, dr amit burande burande sir uh, for his tic tac toe uh i don't know what is tic tac to so so um, uh, amit please go ahead as the rajiv has a problem with sharing the screen we have kept his lecture at the last yeah i have joined i can present at the last okay right amit okay. go ahead uh am i audible yes and yeah, my are... presentation is seen yeah 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 Make go ahead it full screen okay. Yeah. Is it okay now? No. No. Ah, yes. yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> myself, Dr. Amit Burande. I am basically a orthopedic and diabetic foot surgeon. My topic is tic tac toe. That's a toe flow and no. It's a game of putting the trio of your hands in a row before your opponent does it, or else you lose the game. and my signs in the are toe that's a bone and infections flow that is the vessels and nerves or vasculopathy and the neuropathy and no that means the metabolic control so it's a game where the three parameters are deciding the outcome and doctor has to place those perfectly to solve the puzzle that's a neuropathy vasculopathy and infection Yes, it's a story of a foot, the diabetic foot. What every surgeon should know before touching the diabetic foot. Diabetic foot is just not the trio of a debridement, dressing with fancy lotions, solutions, and creams, and amputation after a couple of days, but it's a Shokantika story of the callous, due to the callous attitude of patients, doctors. and the society at such what should we know before starting a treatment to a diabetic foot pathophysiology of the disease and proper classification clinical assessment laboratory workup and principles of offloading so diabetes mellitus as you all know it's a multifactorial metabolic disorder affecting virtually every cell tissue and organ of a body and it's a slow poison the glycosylated proteins lead to the micro and macro angiopathies and over a period of time it will lead to the complications like nephropathy retinopathy neuropathy and the vasculopathy of this the neuropathy and vasculopathy will combine and it will select the foot as the target end organ and the increasing incidence and prevalence of diabetes the foot complications are increasing very exponentially the paradigm is shifting from one foot to the bilateral foot 
and multiple cases are coming so what things one has to start before touching a diabetic foot patient what i mean by a diabetic foot patient is not only a patient who has got a ulcer or a gangrene or a major issue but a patient who is running a long standing diabetes and who is following his physician for a regular checkup so it begins with the shoes of the patients both in soles and out soles so in my opd diabetic patients are not supposed to come barefooted they are supposed to come with their shoe the examination starts with their shoes the neuropathy assessment plantar pressure studies vascular assessment foot joint mobility a very important factor where every joint of the foot has to be assessed for its mobility and a systemic evaluation of course so let us see what things are we supposed to see in a neuropathy just touching a toe or asking a question whether do you feel a sensation is not enough for assessing the neuropathy we have got a 10 g monofilament which is giving us a touch sensation and before that what patient loses is a vibration sensation for its evaluation a 128 hertz tuning fork but it's a non objective and patient needs intelligence for this and a more objective and which is required for the research is the biothesiometer which we use for the basic vibration studies so here you can see on the left side these are the up to the 15 volts the vibrations they are appreciated by the patient as considered as a normal so on the left side it's a study of a normal foot on the right side you can see that the right left foot is showing 20 24.6 and 17.9 so the front foot of this patient is showing the more neuropathy and in addition to that we can have a common study of the vibration and monofilaments where this yes and no are written they are subject of a monofilament yes or monofilament no and now here you can see the foot where 41.9 that is a very high neuropathy foot and patient up to beyond 50 are considered as absolutely foot at risk the 15 to 25 is mild category 25 to 40 is moderate and 40 plus is high risk category after that the patients who are having the callus which we are going to see in the subsequent slides they should undergo the plantar pressure studies what is the plantar pressure here you can see it's called as a harris mat or the podimeter where the thermal scanning of the foot is done and with the help of a software its images are retrieved where we can see the shades of green blue and the red and yellow it is how it looks in this case the right foot it's more or less green uh, sorry the blue and a little bit of green with a very red spot it's supposed to be the normal on the left foot you can appreciate a big red dot it is at the ip joint and this is suggestive of the hallux limitus or the hallux rigidus at that point which is causing the minimal mobility and increased pressure in these areas in the subsequent clinical cases we will see how to deal with this we are doing these studies regularly in our foot laboratory and this is one more case where you can see the abnormal pressures are seen at the ip joint on the great toe and the tips of the raised three toes it's a very typical scenario where you see the hallux rigidus or the hallux limitus and clawing of the other toes and if you don't at the appropriate time this will break down it will start the infection and ultimately a deep infection will be set down we'll see how these infections set it up in the vascular assessment what we are supposed to do is the clinical assessment where you see the dorsalis pedis posterior tibial and popliteal pulses compare it from the opposite side and the upper limbs presence or absence of tuft of the hairs on the foot the glossy skin which is suggestive of the ischemic skin skin reperfusion after the blanching and the brittle nails these all are the clinical signs apart from that a more objective criteria is like ankle brachial index where uh, upper limb systolic pressure and the lower limb systolic pressure are compared if it is less than 0.9 or 0.8 it's a arterial disease as begin the only fallacy of this test is in a chronic diabetic foot patients 
vessels are highly calcified and sometimes you will get pseudo reading that abi is more than 1 the second thing is handheld doppler which is a very easy instrument and rather than while checking the abi it is very useful next to that uhg doppler i personally prefer the uhg doppler because it's more objective medical legally safe and usually i use for the patients who are supposed to undergo a routine diabetic foot surgeries not the critical limb ischemia surgeries like a basic neuropathic foot or a basic infective foot but when it comes to a gangrenous stow or patient is having severe critical limb ischemia or your arterial doppler has shown the tandem atherosclerotic plaques or the short segment stenosis in the superficial femoral or the popliteal vessels i would prefer to do the mr angiography the question will raise whether to go for mr angiography ct angiography or the traditional digital subtraction angiography and the last one which is a carbon uh, dioxide angiography the ct angiography should not be done because most of the vessels are calcified and you don't get any data and in case of a uh, traditional digital subtraction angiography most of the patients are borderline nephropathy or frank nephropathy and a dye may cause harm more than the use so it's better to avoid the transcutaneous oxygen monitoring machine that what we call as a tcpo2 they are not available everywhere and i am also not personal using it it is just to complete the list of vascular assessment of a patient so what all happens what all these pathologies are combining and where they will lead to us so main there is a neuropathic there is a possibility of a purely ischemic and there is a possibility of a neuroischemic so please mind well that most of the patient who are walking in a opd of a diabetologist they are neuropathic patients by the time they are coming to a surgeon they have converted to a neuroischemic patients and very few patient fortunately in our subcontinent they are purely ischemic and vascular patients it might be related to our different genetics or the eating habits so what is a neuropathic presentation spectrum there is a burning feet or the numb feet numb feet is the worst because no complaint no treatment and no evaluation then there is a callus there is a claw there is a plantar ulcer and there is a charco so this is a spectrum of the neuropathy we will see one by one so this is callus callus is hyperkeratosis of the superficial layers of the skin and it happens where the pressure points are altered or there is a exaggerated pressure or change in the dynamics of the foot so this is how the callus callus will lead to the hemorrhage the hemorrhage will lead to the ulcer so usually you will find there is a nice callus sitting outside you will just keep on saying patient there is nothing to your foot and an ulcer is developing deep inside and it is eating your bones and ultimately it will lead to the osteomyelitis this is how patients of the neuropathy they lead to a major infectious end so here we will see case one by one so he is a patient you can appreciate his great toe it is showing a callosity when there is a callus in this area it means that his forefoot is being excessively loaded so just removing of a callus on a opd basis is not sufficient here so what we have gone for is a tendoachillis lengthening which is percutaneous lengthening done in this case and it is followed by a modified kellers orthoplasty in a typical kellers orthoplasty we excise the base of the proximal fragment but here as it was not hallux rigidus but it was hallux limitus i just did a percutaneous capsulotomy and non wet bearing for a couple of days and ultimately the wound heal this is how the wound should look there should be only three colors there should be a color of blood there should be a pink color of the skin and there should be the color of the blood so this is first type second clawing i will i am trying to cover the different presentation patterns because every diabetic foot is a different and every patient needs a different approach so is the patient who approached to me with this presentation great toe already amputated the second toe it was in a infected wound and this was the scenario of the three digital or the lateral digits on history patient was recent onset diabetes and he was a chronic alcoholic so after doing the vascular workup which was absolutely normal the 
biothesiometer was showing moderate to severe neuropathy and i decided routinely in the diabetic foot patients there is no role of emg and ncs they are all confusing simple monofilament and biothesiometer is what we need but in this case specifically as history was not matching to the outcome i did the nerve conduction and it is suggestive of severe motor sensory axonal and demyelinating polyneuropathy involving the both lower limbs no I typical glow and stopping i'm sorry to disturb you uh, we are running short of time so can you hurry up yeah yeah i will take one two more minutes i need a time for that so this is up and ultimately what we did is the correction of clawing of the toes and this is the ultimate outcome so there is a plantar pressure or there is one more wound so all wounds are not similar now this patient has presented with a wound on the plantar side x ray is showing osteomyelitis history of recent onset diabetes but when you compare it with the opposite limb you can appreciate that this is definitely a cavus and the first metatarsal is more inclined towards the ground so this patient was treated with a totally different approach debridement excision of the bone i went posteriorly i did the tendo achilles lengthening peroneus longus to peroneus brevis transfer to uh, control the dynamics and at the same time the flexor hallucis longus was excised behind the ankle so this makes the complete surgery and this is the outcome of the patient with completely healed after healing of the wound he show me the post documents or the doc past documents where he was going undergoing the treatment for hansons as well so mind well now we'll see the glimpses of sarco a patient coming in your opd diabetic patient acute onset of swelling no fever redness normal tc and procal swelling reduces with evaluation and most important is the crease sign this is a patient of typical acute sarco don't treat it as a cellulitis don't debride these patients the treatment is a total contact cast and the principle of total contact casting is immobilization of the ankle and redistribution of the forces chronic sarco when these patients they are not properly treated or they go in a complication stage of sarco which is quite common in 40 to 50% of patients despite of the best possible treatment in acute stages they are going to land up in this kind of foot the talus is on the ground the foot is rocker bottom non healing ulcer for 3 years and the clotos patient was treated here with talectomy ta lengthening calcaneo tibial fusion and after that the wound healed and patient was given a special shoes for the lifelong and patient is happy walking on this in the vascular case so offloading is what uh, in diabetic foot plantar ulcers it is not important what we put on the wound for healing but it is what we take out of the ulcers so these are the commercially made offloading devices these all chappal shown in the lower line they are done in my opd a cobbler sits in my diabetic foot opd 3 hours a day and we design shoe for every patient in a vascular foot a digital gangrene a dry gangrene approach is always do an angiography do angioplasty if possible short segment stenosis in the popliteal artery and the short uh, femoral artery they are quite amenable infra popliteal angioplasties they are very difficult especially after the age of 75 patients with chronic smoking and ckd results are very bad here we opened up the vessels the foot is reperfused very well the wound looks like this it will be yellow first it will start looking black don't worry at this stage keep on dressing keep on dressing keep on dressing give good antiplatelets and this is the ultimate result but every patient is not that fortunate this is the patient with two digits we did the angioplasty in this patient but patient's age was very high 82 years plus only peroneal could be plastied not the tibial and anterior posterior tibial so no good perfusion in the foot ultimately this was the immediate post operative picture but patient landed in below knee amputation so when is the point of amputation when this point of patients here when patient has presented conversion of a dry gangrene to the wet gangrene is a time where you have to think about the amputation otherwise it will risk the life local oxygen therapies this is a very primitive when i had done in 2010 this patient had undergone in one of the corporate hospitals during the angioplasty the balloon was stuck they could not do they just had to come out after that we did the debridement give the local oxygen therapy in the chamber which was designed by me and ultimately the wound healed patient died 2 years after because of his comorbid conditions nowadays this 
pressurized chambers are available. We are treating right now with this patient and this stump has converted into a shrinkage of the stump. And this is the picture, patient is still under the treatment. So I'm convinced with the local oxygen therapies, hyperbaric oxygens are mentioned in the literature, but results are unequivocal and not available in the tire two and three cities. So I'm not very fan of these hyperbaric oxygens. Every black toe is not uh, endovascular work to be done because this patient typical, this looks like a gangrene, but a ulcer on opposite side, it give me a hint that it is not a typical vascular thing. Look at the patient, glossy skin, limited opening of the jaw, ANA is positive, it's a systemic sclerosis, let the patient be managed with the medical management. Only if it converts to a wet gangrene, then there is a role of amputation. So type of surgeries, we can have an urgent like vascular interventions, bumpectomies or osteomyelitis, prophylactic like deformity corrections, clot or release or the tendon transfers, and the life-saving surgeries are major debridements in sepsis or the amputations. Infections, I'm not dealing much. It itself is every topic is a different topic. I'm trying to cover the glimpses. So cellulitis, abscess, osteomyelitis, sepsis and shock is the spectrum. Only thing remember is longitudinal spraying along the long tendons and horizontal spread through the adductor hallucis, transcompartmental spread to the introsia. That's why you don't, uh, you see the plantar ulcer and the wound or the, there is an abscess on the dorsum. It's quite common. So it's not debridement of a foot. It is a lower limb exploration, which may lead to the debridement till hip and anterior abdominal wall. So be prepared for this on table. So these are the two classifications which are routinely used, the Wagner's classification and in, in the I University of Hamden. I think it's well. And this is about the risk category and the management. So I would like to conclude the diabetic foot management is a damage control treatment. There is always a loss of capital, but minimizing the loss is the success and amputation is not a defeat, but it's a beginning of a new battle. This is where I got training in the diabetic foot with Dr. David Armstrong in the Salsa clinic. And this is my team where physician, radiologist, full-time diabetologist, vascular surgeon, and interventional radiologist are working. And this is Go Slim, that is the Surya Limb mission, which we are wearing for the last six years. And personally, I'm working last 14 years in the diabetic foot. Thank you very much for the patients listening. It's a different topic for the orthopedic surgeons and our liking, but I am focused on the diabetic food. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit, for your uh, different topic. So I think there won't be any, uh, we should not take any questions right now because you are running short of time. Mm -hmm. Abhijit, you go ahead with your presentation on giant cell tumor. Okay, sir. I think I have to stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's true. But, but Amit, uh, it was a wonderful presentation, though it was a long, and our theme is only case based, but I like that your presentation and uh, there yeah, is a sir. new accumulation of knowledge. Uh, yeah, sir. I just make it a presentation based because only case based discussion cannot throw uh, explanation. Okay. We'll, okay. we'll see. No problem, but now. it's a very good. Yes. It's very good. Thank you, sir. Okay. We start from first. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Audible. Yeah. Can you, uh, you go ahead? Okay, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, uh, Dr. Gade Gunes, sir, my own Kolhapur Orthopedic Association, Abhayankar, sir, for giving me opportunity to present my work in this such a beautiful forum with so much talented people here. Out. I will present a case in a young lady, a giant cell tumor, and a 26-year-old lady came to my OPD with chief complaints of pain over the distal third of the left thigh since two months. And there were swelling over the distal thigh since two months. There were there was restricted range of motion of left knee joint since one month. Pain was dull aching in nature, continuous time goes on increasing with activities and getting partially relieved with rest and medicine. Patient was unable to bear weight on left lower limb due to pain. After examination, there was diffuse swelling over the distal third of the left thigh, margins were not clearly palpable, demarcable on palpation. Temperature over the swelling was normal. Tenderness was present over the distal thigh. Patellofemoral tenderness were present. No uh, joint line tenderness of the left knee joint. There was terminal restriction of range of motion of the left knee joint. And hip and ankle examination were normal. And there were no distal neurovascular deficit. 
she came to my opd with this x ray done outside in that x ray we can clearly see a eccentric lytic lesion on to uh, mainly involving involving the lateral femoral condyle uh, mainly the epiphyseal lesion eccentric and lytic most probably a giant cell tumor then i further investigated this patient with mri these are the uh, coronal images sagittal images in these images we can clearly see on t2 there is hyper intense signal on t1 there is hyper intense signal and uh, we can see clearly expandable lesion or uh, eccentric type onto the mainly involving lateral femoral condyle consistent with our uh, diagnosis of giant cell tumor and with our x rays also so uh, this was the mri report of her which is clearly mentioning the giant cell tumor then i went ahead uh, with the needle biopsy even though i am sure that it might be a giant cell tumor the basis come that we should first do a needle biopsy so i went ahead with the needle biopsy at this time i consider that i will uh, go from the lateral aspect i will do pureteage and bone grafting that's why i had done a needle biopsy from the lateral aspect and uh, biopsy turned out to be uh, consistent with our clinical and radiological diagnosis that is giant cell tumor but uh, other investigations i had done that all blood investigations were normal and ct chest i had done because all, all we know that uh, some giant cell tumor the pulmonary metastases are very common so but unfortunately she lost the follow up for one or one and a half months because of her financial reason and she came back to my opd and at that time i have done this fresh x rays and in this x ray the lesion has progressed very aggressively further in one and a half months after biopsy and in the lateral x ray we can see there is clear cut uh, breach in the anterior cortex of the lateral femoral condyle we can make out here we can make out here okay so at this moment i was in a confusion that uh, what is might be the plan previously i thought that the curettage bone grafting will be sufficient but after seeing this x ray and anterior breach in the breach in the anterior cortex of lateral femoral condyle i was little confusion one more point uh, confusing point in this x-ray my biopsy tract was on the lateral aspect and breach in the here is on the anterior aspect so what approach to take is one another dilemma at that time i had so uh, lesion has progressed ag aggressively after biopsy there was breach in the anterior cortex biopsy tract on the lateral side and uh, what i thought that what might be the option whether to go for a salvage option with a mega prosthesis or to uh, preserve the knee and do extended cure attach and bone grafting by a sandwich technique so considering her age considering her financial uh, aspects i went ahead uh, to do a extended cure attach with the bone grafting with a sandwich technique and uh, i have done this procedure with patient in a supine position i have taken a anterior incision skin incision over the left knee more on the lateral aspect then i went ahead with the lateral parapatellar approach i had made corticotomy anteriorly and i used whatever the breach was there i have extended that breach and i have done the thorough corticotomy so that i can uh, extend that corticotomy to the edges of the lesion so that i can see each and every corner of that lesion so that i can remove uh, every lesion so thoroughly done curettage removed all tumor tissue and extended the curettage with adjuvants like hydrogen peroxide phenol i have used uh, i have borrowed one mechanical bar from my ent friend and i have removed the bridges with the mechanical burr while doing surgery i can make out there is thin shell of bone present in the subarticular region even on the posterior aspect the cortex is very thinned out because while doing the uh, cauterization with phenol the bone was just burning and i can make it out the bone is very thin if i use very uh, hazardously i can might damage the uh, neurovascular structure posteriorly so uh, after doing thorough curettage extended curettage with all the adjuvants whatever the residual cavity was present i have managed this with the sandwich technique as we all know sandwich technique we use a graft in the subarticular region then put a gel foam and then again put the cement and graft and whole construct i have augmented with a uh, locking plate of the distal femur i have harvested uh, ipsilateral iliac crest graft and cancellous uh, graft these were the entrop images you can see clearly here the bridge in the anterior cortex and these are the entrop siam images 
this is the immediate post op x ray where i have done the cementing and uh, the thing is that my cement has gone further up beyond the proximal locking screw so that the cement won't break these are the clinical images the skin incision has built heal and uh, this is the one year follow up x ray okay these are clinical images where she attended full flexion of the knee joint full extension of the knee joint and these are the her latest videos okay uh, while she was walking and uh, her knee range of motion where she had attended a full extension as well as full flexion so at the end of the treatment she is very happy and surgeon is also very happy thank you so abhijit a very good case uh, uh, one question uh, what is the duration right now how many days post surgery one and half year sir one and half year till how many years you would like to keep her in follow up sir 5 uh, to 6 years sir 5 to 6 years no, okay no. and stop sharing your screen i think so abhijit. now uh, are there any questions to abhijit yes um, may i ask one question please yeah yeah yes, yes, sir i am dr sauji hello hi yes sir quiet and is it not dangerous to use phenol when there is a thin cortex posteriorly just i want to ask my queen yes sir <laughs> it's very dangerous sir but uh, i want to do everything possible for her sir because i don't want to take any chances and uh, i was using phenol for first time i have borrowed phenol from one of my senior colleague and uh, while using i have make sure that i am very gentle and while after using phenol also i have put the normal saline continuously irrigating sir so that i can yeah, see yeah. whether i am uh, piercing the cortex or not yeah one one question uh, you not shown the serial fall of x rays because the gct is the lesion like that the, there is always recurrence always sir uh, whatever last x ray i have seen that is one and half year follow up okay mm. latest x ray sir for presentation only i have borrowed from it. okay but is there any lysis anything lysis around the ground till now sir uh, not there okay hands cross sir i have already informed them that uh, it is the most common thing and if it happens uh, the treatment will be the same sir ct scan also you have to follow up ct scan Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, I think the CT scan even the before he she had come after one month, and there you have seen it has progressed very aggressively. Yes, so sir. To see the breach in cortices anteriorly, posteriorly, and to delineate uh, the approach, it is better to have a CT even at that stage. That's what I think. Okay. Nowadays, the very good salvage. Yeah, it is a salvage, but nowadays they are doing N block resection and resection, sir, because that is the treatment of choice. They yes, have been before uh, denosubab injection. Yeah. At least six doses they are giving, and then make it hard, and then taking out uh, and, and block excision. That is the treatment of choice right now. Because they don't want to give chance, because it will always recur. There is a study there. There is always recurrence. Sir, how do you quote this? I always recur. It's only that I think uh, recurrence is there because we can't do thorough. There is. Some yeah. after so, five to six years, there will be again the. You meant to say in this kind of tumor where it's already aggressive and uh, large lesion is there, sir. Before doing this case, I have spoken with the two ortho onco surgeon. One is from Hyderabad, Doctor Kishore Reddy, and one is Dominic Puttur sir from uh, Kerala. Okay, uh, both came with the opinion that you go ahead with the salvage, uh, you preserve the knee. okay and because of her age and because of the financial constraints uh, they have advised me to uh, do a salvage thing okay okay nice so abhijit very good excellent uh, yeah uh, so now i invite uh, dr rajiv sir to uh, share, share his last case
is my screen seen yes, oh, yes. Yeah. so uh, i'll be just uh, covering quickly about osteochondroplasty in adolescent hips <clears throat> Uh, not able to move my slides here. Just one second. Yeah. Uh, is my slides visible? Yes. Yeah. Please. Sir. Yeah. So this is a 12 year old boy who had come to me with a right hip pain since 18 months. He had restricted range of motion and uh, he had adductor deformity, adduction deformity of around 15 degrees. So this was the uh, uh, scenario. Obviously this child had a, a perthes uh, which was neglected and uh, uh, he came to me and presented to me with the restricted uh, movements of the right hip. You can see that there is a hinge abduction uh, on the lateral aspect of the uh, uh, acetabulum. You can see that and the, there is a femoral head overgrowth. So uh, we planned for the osteochondroplasty. Previously, it was known as chelectomy uh, and uh, it can be a further indication for a cam impingement also. So we went ahead with the anterior uh, hip uh, approach. Before doing that, I did a orthogram just to see the uh, contour of the femoral head. And you can see that uh, here, you can see that the bump is visible on the anterolateral aspect. This is the bump, which is seen visible. And when we did a movie, uh, movie on the CM, this bump was impinging and was not allowing further abduction of and internal rotation at the hip joint. So we started with doing a adductor tenotomy to increase the range of motion and we went through a an anterior incision. So uh, this is a plane between uh, tensor fascia lata and sartorius, which was separated out. And once we do uh, the, the deeper layer is of rectus femoris and once you uh, separate out the rectus primoris from the ASIS and AIIS, uh, you can see the anterior joint capsule. And when we re release the subcapsularis sub muscles and muscles around the uh, joint, you can see the capsule very well seen. Uh, I opened the capsule, uh, the hip joint, the articular cartilage was seen, which was very smooth and I could puncture the cartilage very easily. Uh, so we marked that uh, uh, lesion on the CM uh, and confirmed it on AP and frog leg images. And then once we had done that, we resected the, uh, uh, the uh, bump. So we had marked that and there is a K wire which I had placed and I just removed that K wire uh, and then went ahead. So I'm just deepening that cut. I'm further cutting the, uh, the osteochondral lesion. And this was a very soft bone which came out and then we just made some drills and with curate uh, we resected the uh, the inner bony uh, bone uh, so that uh, the impingement is taken care of so this was the lesion this was the graph uh, the articular cartilage surface which was removed of course the bone beneath that was also removed and this is the uh, intra uh, movements that we could achieve. He had nearly full move movements. And good rotations also. And this was his uh, post-operative x-ray. He is just around three months post-op. I have started him 
uh, 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 weight bearing uh, with support still and probably will continue uh, with the same for a few more months and then start him on full weight bearing. So similar, I'll just like to share one more case. This child had a fractured neck of femur, a 10 year old girl, which was fixed outside with two CC screws. Unfortunately, she went uh, underwent AVN and landed with a bump over the anterolateral aspect of the hip. And uh, we released that bump uh, with the similar approach and with similar technique. And so this was his, her post-op X-ray showing good uh, coverage of the femoral head. This is her nine months follow-up. And this is her current uh, clinical picture, which was taken maybe around 10 to 15 days back. Another child who had a, a skiffy, who had a, a grade two acute on chronic skiffy and uh, had done a in situ fixation at the first stage. And uh, once the physis was closed fully, there was a bump which was seen on the anterolateral aspect of the hip. And again, we went through the anterior approach. This was a very, very heavy child weighing around 110 kgs. And we had really tough time uh, reaching to his uh, uh, hip joint. Uh, we went through the same technique and then resected the bump. You can appreciate that there is a C-shaped sign here now so that uh, the uh, it shows that the bump is removed. Even on the AP X-ray, you can make out that the bump was clearly visible here, which is now gone. So osteochondroplasty, uh, which was previously known as uh, chelectomy, is a useful procedure. Another advantage of this is that you are opening the capsule so that the intra-articular pressure uh, in cases of Perthes disease, it's also uh, decreased so that the range of motion is increased. And uh, we can get a better results, not the best, but uh, these are the salvage situations where we have to try to uh, give our best for the patient. Uh, Raju, uh, very well cases, well done. So for our knowledge, what are the likely complications in such surgeries and how to prevent that? Uh, sir, complications is because uh, we are dealing on the anterior aspect. Uh, so you have to obviously take care of the femoral artery and femoral nerve, which are very near to the uh, joint. Next thing important is the medial circumflex artery. So if you uh, uh, by mistake injure that, then the chances of getting AVN are very high. So in cases also in cases like in DDH or uh, any intra-articular surgeries and on the hip, you have to be very careful. Um, so apart from that, I don't think that there is any other situation where uh, a, a surgeon should worry about it. So does this lead to early closure of the epiphysis? How is that? Uh, what was the age these patients? The, yeah, so the uh, Perthes was the patient was 11 years. Okay. Yeah, so even if the physis closes early, uh, it's still okay, but he will get a good range of motion. And what the our area of approach is the ante anterior lateral or basically lateral, but it depends upon anterolateral, posterior lateral um, aspect. So that uh, most of the times you do not en encounter the physis. And it is spared. And so it is a, you, of, you mean it is a metaphysial bump? Yeah, it's always a metaphysial bump. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But does this alter the ultimate fate of that hip, this procedure? Yes. Uh, it will, even if this... Uh, but they because go, in, in, in Parthis, the head itself is deformed. It is a mushroom-shaped head. Yes. Yeah, so, so this child... Has, when, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So when this child had come to me, he had no movements and he had an adduction deformity of 15 degrees. And okay. from adduction deformity of 15 degrees, now I am able to get him to around 15 to 20 degrees of abduction. He is able to now sit uh, cross leg. Uh, okay. So I think that is a good result. And if even if this lasts for another decade, the, then uh, it will be easier. 
secondly converting these hips to a total hip also will be easier because uh, we are not harming uh, anything at the intertrochanteric level so converting these hips yeah. to um, and uh, there are other procedures like you can do shelf osteotomies but again you are creating a, a joint which is uh, incongruent so here we are trying to make a joint which is congruent Okay. Any uh, uh, comparative study with osteotomy, like valgus osteotomy or varus osteotomy to compare with this? So there are specific indications for doing a valgus osteotomy or a varus osteotomy. Varus osteotomy okay. is done in Perthes in early stages where it is still grade 1, grade 2A, uh, at the most 2B. But once uh, the head is start already in fragmentation stage and subsequently it is in uh, reshaping stage, then there is no role of doing a varus osteotomy. Here, another option will be uh, doing a valgus osteotomy. But like I yes. said, converting to future THRs is again going to be difficult. Uh, and uh, you may still land up with uh, uh, arthritic hip. Okay. Yeah, that okay. Is, uh, I wanted yeah. to comment on this. Uh, this is the uh, the procedure is used for only for the to make the future THR easier. That is the that is that's why this osteochondroplasty is there. But nowadays we are doing with the with the hip arthroscopy. It is very easy only two or three. Just yes. and it is very easy technique instead of a big tech, uh, big incision and then uh, again the wound healing problem with hip scope. It is very much a quicker procedure. Just yes. shave it off. Yeah, I think the main aim of this surgery is to give the mobile, painless and stable okay. hip after yes. all these things. And what are the chances of head getting more unviable because of this anterior aliofemoral approach which you are using? Any problem with vascularity which later need to so, be... Yes, sir. if you take care of the medial circumflex artery, then you are preserving the supply to the head. And again, fovea is going to supply the uh, supply to the femoral head. So you are not really damaging anything by doing this surgery. Another way of doing this is safe surgical dislocation method where you are likely to damage the, um, uh, the vascularity if you are not careful. So uh, this is an approach which is relatively very safe. And uh, uh, so that's why we are using this. Again, like Sir said, uh, uh, doing a hip arthroscopy is another option. But uh, uh, I think expertise of doing hip arthroscopy is not much in India as yet. And uh, probably in due course of time, when hip arthroscopies will come in tier two and tier three cities, probably uh, that indications we will all uh, will explore. So uh, in US and uh, in Western world, uh, the case which I showed of Skifi, they are doing combining both the procedures together. So they are doing in situ fi fixation and simultaneously doing the osteochondroplasty with the hip scope. We are doing regularly here, here hip arthroscopy and doing this all FBI surgeries. Sir, we'll invite you to Kolhapur then. Oh, thank you. <laughs> regularly. I think it's a wonderful results which you have shown in all the cases and certainly it is very useful for this patient to get a painless mobile hip rather than a... Yeah. I think we'll have a few questions for Dr. Burande if you have, then otherwise. Uh... Yeah, yeah, Amit. I think, yeah. yeah. For, for diabetic food, I would like to ask, like if the patient with diabetes comes to your OPD and you mm -hmm. see some kind of ischemia, so mm -hmm. what chances you give that he, because the vasculopathy, neuropathy will be ongoing. So what chances Obviously. he will go that he will go into the amputation at certain point of time, any time frame you can give? No, you can never predict it, sir. And ischemia is a very vague term. We have to know whether it is a mild ischemia, moderate ischemia or the limb at risk. That's why I said ki you for every patient who goes in a OPD of a diabetologist, they are supposed to do ABI. And when the ABI is affected, then patient should undergo on the Dopplers. And when the Dopplers are not good, or patient has primarily presented in my OPD or physician's OPD with a black toe, then straightway they should go for the MR angiography. And if there are the short segment stenosis of the superficial femoral or the popliteal vessels, then uh, ballooning and stenting is a good option. They give the good results. If the supra patellar 
vessels are good but infrapopliteal vessels are bad they may try a little bit of angioplasty stenting is impossible but doing only peroneals are of no worth either anterior tibial or posterior tibial should be doing well in these patients but they are very borderline but once one digit falls there are very high chances that they will go into major amputations but to prevent these major amputations despite of uh, either we i classify it as two either patient has not undergone the vascular work because of deficiency of monetary sources or the availability of the sources or intraoperatively it is not possible recently my two patients they have come out of cath lab without proceeding the surgery as everything was calcified in those toes we go for the four foot amputation that is our next line of defense we fight it with the local oxygen therapies and uh, sometimes hyperbarics and the platelets anti platelet drugs like that and if that line is broken then we have to go for the bk but patients are having short segment stenosis they are very good for the outcomes and one more question is like patient is already having one of the toes which is amputated and now mm -hmm. the, the signs are uh, getting into the other toes and he uh, gets more worried no my question the question here is why he has got amputation whether it's a traumatic amputation it's a ischemic gangrene amputation or he has a local vasculitis or it's a neuropathic amputation so that's what i'm saying whether you have to define patient whether it's ischemia or it's ischemic kind of amputation which is common is, and it is, these it, are the distal arteries which are getting involved if i obviously, see obviously If yes. If the distal pulses and uh, doesn't bother for this uh, proximal circle. When patient time. has already undergone one digit amputation, most probably your DP, PT, they are all going to be the absent. But if his one digital amputation has settled at that level, you just keep them on triple antiplatelets and wait and watch. The main role at that time is a uh, medical management. One component of the surgical management is the high tibial. osteotomies and the translation uh, what we call as the horizontal translation tibial osteotomies i have never done it but it is in my tunnel i would come with my results maybe after a couple of years yeah but this is totally unpredictable disease you have to hold it's like a war that you are you are lost one post you have to go back and you have to hold the next post and you have to try to defend that post so four foot is my first post of defense Yeah, I think one more question is like, uh, do you always uh, recommend uh, for charcoal foot arthropathy with some deformity without any obvious wound outside to go for mm -hmm. some stabilization or fusion surgeries? What are your See, criteria in such uh, senseless limbs? The acute charcoal when patient has presented with severe swelling, edema, all these conditions. So universal uh, dictum is go for the total contact cast. give elevation reduce edema do a casting after 7 days change the cast the edema will keep on reducing so it depends on what stage you are dealing with acute stage don't touch that in the convalescent phase when the things are settling there are two schools of thought most of the people still they prefer to go for the tcc and let the foot remodel on its own and 20 to 30% patient or the people prefer to do a corrective surgeries or the fixation surgeries but results are not very good Yeah. whatever you do 6 months non wet bearing is must for these acute charco patients and what i have shown in the last case that is the chronic charco where the talus has come on the ground or the usually it's a, it's, it's either a talus or it's a calcan uh, a cuboid which comes on the ground so whatever has come bumpectomy and try to achieve the fusion the three principal things in these cases are you have to lengthen the tendo achilles tendo achilles is the gatekeeper of the diabetic foot so ta lengthening excision of necrotic segment of the bones which will be shown on your mri and try to achieve the fusions for the fusions i usually prefer the elisa row ring fixator as in case of our routine uh, let's say uh, peritoneal arthrosis for non charco patient we go for the uh, tcc nail or that kind of things but these are usually potentially infected or they are easily infected things so mm -hmm. better to go with the minimal implants and external fixators whatever you operate 6 months non wet bearing is a dictum i have till now i have operated 12 patients only one patient has gone into failure because patient just started walking in 3 months but god's gift is in case of this charco chronic charco bony fusion is not the target even if you get a fibrous fusion and my patient in this patient there was a non union at the tibio calcaneal joint but fortunately calcaneo cuboid joint was fused and that pseudo arthrosis patient is now using uh, for the mobilization yeah, yeah yeah i think when sometimes the implant fails even they even after that they do most of the time well <laughs> implant failure is a dictum implant <laughs> failure is a dictum and even they do and very well even with those bad x-rays sometimes yes yes, yes.
It's, it's a wonderful diabetic talk for uh, even whatever Dr. Gadigone sir is saying. It's an eye opener and many informative points which has come up. Gadigone sir, you wanted to have any final comments? No, no. It is a very good uh, presentation of all uh, uh, Age Surgeon Forum of Kolapur Orthopedic Society. I believe that they will uh, also present the next webinar in a few months so that uh, other uh, colleagues are also will get a chance to present their work. The Kolapur Orthopedic Society is always a very vibrant branch and there are so many surgeons they are doing a very good work. And we are as a MA uh, wish to give the platform to all AIM surgeons of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and to tell you very Frankly, today, up to six, up to June, all Saturday and Sunday, Sundays, alternate Sunday and Saturday are cool. So the things are coming up now. So thank yeah. you very much. It's a very time. Dr. Santapuri, you want to add something? It was wonderful, sir. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. I uh, Vote up, thanks. Yes, sir. I think it's a wonderful session today, which we'll have. All the talks were quite informative with take home messages, and mostly they were within the time limit. And we could finish this within proper 90 minutes as we have planned. So thanks, uh, all the speakers, for all those wonderful uh, case presentation. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Our convener for this today's uh, episode, Dr. Rajendra Abhankar, Dr. Vasudev Gadigone, MOA president. Uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Uh, Santapure and Dr. Tonpe, and all the five speakers, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Sachin, Rajiv, Amit, and Abhijit, for their wonderful deliberations. And hope to have this uh, wonderful session on another topic soon within few coming months. So again, I thank you all for uh, taking out the time and uh, uh, taking extra efforts. Uh, I think Dr. Santapure will have some final. Santabura sir, you wanted to say something? So, okay, we will uh, end the... Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. On, I think. On Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ulam, you can stop sharing your... Uh, yeah, on behalf of Kolapur Orthopedic Association, I would like to thank Maharashtra Orthopedic Association to give us a platform. And I think when whenever there is a next session, uh, because we have a lot of young surgeons coming up, we will be there with more good cases. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good night. Thank good you. Good night, yeah. Good night, sir. Good night. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajan. See you again. Thanks again all.